Hey folks, Steve here, and I'm answering your questions today. Um, and I have been putting this off because I wanted to make sure that I was cleaned up and presentable uh, for the camera. Um, I've not been on camera for a while. Um, and if you look at some of my older videos, you'll notice that my hair was shorter and it was starting to grow, starting to grow, starting to grow. Well, it's actually quite long now. <laughs> uh, but I just got out of the shower and cleaned myself up, so it, it's kind of wet at the moment. Um, the funny thing about the hair being that uh, it's really, my wife really likes my hair long, and uh, I'm kind of getting the point where I really want to cut it, so I need to do that. Probably the next time I'm on camera, I'll have short hair. Um, so I wanted to, to, to get on camera and answer the questions that uh, the subscribers or the commenters asked in a previous video as we were sort of looking at starting the new year with 500 subscribers. And um, I have the list of questions over here and some notes to help guide my, my talking to you and the answers to your questions. So um, thank you all for, for those who asked the questions. And, um, you know, maybe at some point we'll do some more videos along these lines where I can answer your questions or, or do whatever at some significant milestone. So um, I, I try to organize those questions a little bit, and I'm just going to talk through it. It's going to be straightforward. I will warn that uh, my camera is being goofy, and it's entirely possible that there will be very abrupt cuts in this video because um, occasionally my camera memory card is screwing up and it stops recording. So things might be a little jumpy. I'll try to address that um, in post-production, I guess, before I get this uploaded to YouTube. Um, so let me just get started right at the top, and I, and I put these questions sort of in an order that made it easy to, to go through them, so don't be offended if you're first or last or in the middle or whatever. Um, I know I've got some long-time watchers, and um, you know, we all ask good questions, so. Um, I'll just start at the top, and, and we'll work our way through it. So, uh, Steve Larson asks, how did you first become exposed to wargaming? Um, and, and, and Steve asked that question because he likes hearing sort of the backstory of, of this, and um, for me, it's kind of interesting because I, I know a lot of people who play war games and they've been into the hobby since they were a kid or they they played with their dads or their uncles or whatever. Um, and really, truly, I only got into war gaming, you know, playing these boxed war games in the last, I guess it must be like five or six years. I'm trying to count back, maybe closer to seven now, now that we're in 2020, um, sort of in that time frame. Um, and it, it's funny because for me, um, I've always liked history and I've always liked gaming. Um, but I've grown up in the generation where that is much easier to do, uh, via PC gaming or, you know, video games in general. Um, and the whole concept of having a boxed board game that is a historical war simulation or war game, um, is something that I didn't really realize existed. And that might sound silly, and I don't know how else to explain it. It seems really weird to say now because I'm in the hobby. I know so many people who play um, or people who who maybe had parents who used to play or something like that. But when I was growing up, um, I always really loved history, uh, uh, absolutely loved history. When I was a kid, um, in elementary school, you would get these scholastic uh, little pamphlet things where you could order books. And one of the things that I ordered was... Um, my first civilization PC game from that. So you would order through the teacher, your parents would like put money in an envelope or a check, and you would order through your teacher, I think, is how it worked, and I got like civilization, and, and I played that, and that was not really historical, but it was in that vein, and, and I sort of kept with that all through, you know, being a teenager and, and going to college, and I just always loved history, and so I played PC games that were historically uh, aligned and that sort of thing. Um, and just growing up where I grew up, there just weren't people I knew that played boxed war games. They just, there was nobody who really played war games, and we played tabletop RPGs, we played Dungeons and Dragons, but not things like, um, World in Flames or, or really anything else that is on my gaming shelf. That was just never a thing, and, and to be honest, I, again, maybe it's because of little exposure or just not looking in the right places even on the internet. I didn't know that this was a thing, and, and, and it's sad, because I think, had I known about it, I would have been into it much, much earlier in my life, because um, to me, it's the it's perfect. It, 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 it's perfect. It feels like, you know, I discovered something I should have known about all along, and that I would be 
um, happy to have this entire time, and I've been missing out, which is the funny thing. Um, and, and so how I was really exposed to it and how I got into where I'm at now is uh, I was browsing the internet and, uh, you know, the board game revival is going on, right? And it has been for years where people are playing a lot of the Euro games. Board games are pretty popular at hobby shops and everything. And um, because I was sort of like looking into it, just kind of paying attention around like tabletop RPGs, which I've been into for a long time. Um, I saw Axis and Allies, the 1941 version, on sale on Amazon for like 20 bucks. And I said, I'll get that. Just, sure, let, let's check it out. And, and it was fun, and it was neat, but it, it's not super historical, and it has its faults. Um, but, but just trying to do research on Axis and Allies and, and other board games pointed me to uh, Twilight Struggle, which I have over on my game shelf. I should have brought it over, but Twilight Struggle is pretty ubiquitous and pretty well known. That was like number one game on Board Game Geek for a while, and I looked at that and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. And I got Twilight Struggle, um, and has I've had fun with that, playing with my wife and friends. And um, obviously, you know, you go to buy Twilight Struggle, and you're at GMTGames.com, um, and for me, it was like one of those dramatic movie moments, like you know, all all of this stuff that I never really knew existed that I didn't comprehend was out there and that people were really into it and then I was down the rabbit hole and buying a bunch of games and and you know I like all historical eras so for me I'm buying you know a little bit of everything um, and I haven't looked back since right so this was for me it was this is the the perfect one of the most perfect hobbies I could imagine because PC games are fun but that takes you out of the human element and it and there is value I think in the tactile moving things yourself um, standing back and looking at a map and, and appreciating the situation, which is harder to do when you're just looking at a screen. Um, I think that merged with my love for history and problem solving. I mean, all that mixes together and it's just awesome and I, and I love it. And I like playing with people even though I'm playing a lot of solitaire, being able to play with people, uh, with friends, and to talk about history because we're all history fans. Um, it's just really awesome and, and I'm glad I found it. So past few years have been, you know, a really a charged time for me in hobbies, um, and that's how I got into wargaming. So, good question, Steve, and I, very long answer, and I could talk a long time about the progression, you know, each stage of wanting to find more historical games on PC, wanting to find more historical war games and all of that, but that's as brief as I can make that. Um, then we'll go on to the next question now, so Grim Norse Fury, who's a long-time watcher and commenter, asks, uh, if I've played Berg's Pax Romana, and if so, what are my thoughts, and do I have a favorite Berg game, and which one it is, and why? So, a couple of questions there, I'll try to answer best I can. So, I do have Pax Romana, uh, and I have, I keep track in a spreadsheet somewhere, like, what games I own, and what I've played, and, and where I'm at with that, and, um, I have played Pax Romana solo, but like fiddling, playing some stuff out. Um, not like a full scenario to, you know, scenario start to scenario end. Um, but I do like it. I like what it does. Uh, it's a little weird in that Pax Romana has, like, the big scenario is like this ten turn epic thing. Each turn's quite long. Can be quite long. Um, and the way they have that is that you're conducting campaign actions. And when you have battles, you're going to get results, and, okay, you fought that battle. But, but when you look at the turn track, what you find is that a turn is like 40 years of time or something like that. And so it's like, well, you're not fighting just this one battle in this one war, right, across 40 years. And, and so it's this weird, like, it, the abstraction of Pax Romana... Like, the high-level stuff makes sense, right? You're taking over different territories of the map, and you're getting money and different things. But the battles are just really strange. So it's like you're, you're not representing a battle. What you've just played out is a series of campaign actions, and the armies lose a percentage of their strength across that battle. So it's like maybe the Romans lost 40% of their army, and, and the Greeks lost 60% of their army, and that's what's left over. And so somehow... That is like boiling out 40 years of conflict and whatever territory was exchanged is where things settled after 40 years. It is weird. Um, but I think for what Pax Romana is, is showing, 
and the number of different cool scenarios that are in C3i magazine, um, and, and the attention to detail on a lot of that is really cool. So I think Patch Ramon is a cool game. I haven't been able to play it to the degree that I'd like to, to the, the level of detail where I could speak really intelligently to it. Um, but I do think it's a cool game with the weird battle stuff. Uh, now, in terms of a favorite bird game, um, whew, that is that is tough. Um, I really like Great Battles of History for what it does, and I really have enjoyed Men of Iron. I don't know that I'd say that it's my favorite. Um, I, I think the funny thing about bird games tend to be that, like, they sometimes the roles are written in a really weird way where he's putting in little jokes in there, and it's funny. Um, but sometimes the systems are just so nuanced and so chromy that, you, you know, it, it's overwhelming. Um, where I think Great Battles of History, at least, you know, it's a system and, and it makes sense to what you're portraying and the battles are cool. He and Mark Herman worked together on that one. I, I guess that's my answer. I'm looking at my game shelf. Um, yeah, I guess that's my, you know, the series Great Battles of History. Really like Great Battles of Alexander and all the, the modules for that. So I guess that's my answer, but, you know, it, with, with Berg having passed, you know, it's just one of those things, like, I want to keep playing more of the games maybe that I haven't played of his and exploring um, the, you know, the, the Bergies, as he liked to call them. Um, uh, and I, won't, I guess I won't dive too deep into to that of, of Berg and his... He was a prickly pear, I guess. I had very little interaction with him on Facebook, and he interesting character that he was. Um, so, uh, sorry that he's passed, and well, we got plenty of great games uh, to, to play in remembrance. Um, so, I'm going to move on to the next question. Occasional Gamer asked, do you have a favorite era for wargaming? Um, and that's tied also to a question that the Fox and Dog asked, uh, the user of the Fox and Dog, I'm saying that right, asked, what is your favorite era and why? Um, and I've been forever cursed with the fact that um, I don't really know if I have a favorite favorite. Um, I like all of history. I really like periods of transition. And so the revolutionary time periods where things really change from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, culturally ch changing, I find very, very interesting. Um, and it's the whole appreciation of human history that I like, which is why I have games from the Bronze Age to modern day hypothetical situations because you look at, you know, what has changed at each stage, right? Well, this is what ancient warfare is like. This is what the powers in the ancient world were doing as that morphs into, you know, Roman Empire period to the Dark dark Ages, you know, late antiquity to the Middle Ages to Renaissance to Enlightenment era and so on and just seeing all of that transition. Um, I think I have a few favorite eras, like specific points in time that I find very, very interesting. Um, and I could do a whole video on, on that. Um, and so uh, I could interpret this question as being like, what's your favorite era for history and what's your favorite era for wargaming specifically? Um, I think I think in general, uh, in terms of history, I think World War I is really interesting. It's, it's sort of why my YouTube icon is uh, a, a photo I took from a museum uh, when I was over in Europe for vacation of a, uh, I think it might, they might have been Austrian, I'm trying to remember now, um, a uh, lancer who's wearing a gas mask and so is the horse. <laughs> um, the World War I's a really fascinating time period. Changes in culture, changes in geopolitical realities, changes in warfare across four years that, that ends up, you know, armies looking very different from what they were just before. Um, World War I is so interesting because of all of that change, and you can watch that change happen. And the world that came before World War I is one way, and the world that came after World War I is another, obviously leading into World War II. But that transitional state is very, very interesting, and, and everything that kind of surrounds that time period is very, very interesting. So I guess that's my favorite favorite um, for just general history, but I like others too. Um, and for wargaming specifically, I think, um, for wargaming, I mean, I guess I, World War II is kind of hard to beat in a lot of ways because there's so many different types of games you can be playing for World War II. You can play strategic games, you can play operational games, you can play tactical games. Um, you can have games that are 
centered in the Pacific and be really about naval warfare or sub games that are just about submarine warfare. Um, you can be playing the Dark Valley, which is the operational East Front. I mean, there's so much that you can do. So I guess just appreciating World War II for the breadth of kind of games you can play it kind of makes it my favorite for that reason, but uh, yeah, it's hard to say for, for that one. So good good questions, guys. And, and I'm, I'm such a high-level generalist guy that it's hard for me to, to hone in on one area um, to focus on. Um, the Fox and Dog has some other questions, which I'll answer now. So do you back up your games with books? If so, what are books you are reading for which games? Um, so I, I do do that, but not always. And some of that's based on my budget and where I'm at in my time budget for how much I can read in a given time period. Um, if I'm balancing between those, you know, playing a game or reading a book, I, you know, I want to do both. I can't do both all the time. Um, so I have, and I've shown it on camera before, uh, the Cataclysm book that is about the East Front in World War II. Um, I, it's in the house right now, uh, not in this room, not in this room. So I don't have it with me, um, or else I'd show it on camera. Uh, you can look up Cataclysm book on Amazon, and you should be able to find it. Um, and I'm reading it alongside The Dark Valley, and I think they complement each other really well. Uh, and so I like that experience. Now, um, I have a bunch of other history books that I, I liked. I would like to pair them with. Um, some of them, it's like games I've played before and that I've played multiple times, and it's fun to go back and read a book on the subject and then connect the dots of what the game is doing. And so a couple of books that, that are kind of like that. Um, so these two books on the successor period after the death of Alexander, these two books are great. Uh, they go well with the game Successors, uh, which is a multiplayer card-driven game that I really, really like. Um, and these two books went, go really well with the game to just help you appreciate and provide color and character to what you're playing. Like, you know, if you don't know who Antipater is and you don't appreciate his story and his backstory and his role in the successor wars, the game just is like, oh, it's it's this guy named Antipater or Antipater or however you want to say it. Um, but these books help you give the character to that person and you understand who he is and what his role in everything is has been. Um, and that makes it more interesting. So I would recommend these books for sure. They were really great reads. Um, similarly, you know, it's stuff like, you know, like here's a, a book, single volume on the Pacific War. The next time I dive deep into a Pacific game, I'll be reading this alongside. I've got a few other Pacific War game, uh, Pacific War books that could go along with, but you know, how many books can you be reading at once? And then um, I'm thinking about doing uh, some End of Empire stuff on camera for you guys, and uh, this Oxford History of the United States Glorious Cause might be one that I'll pair with it as I read through. It's very big and thick. It'll be hard to get through um, while I'm playing things. I'll, I'll, I'll outgame what I can read, probably. Um, but that is just some examples, and, it, and it's hard, because again, like you play through a game and you play through it quickly, but it takes longer to read like an 800-page book. Yeah. You know, you got to figure it out. Um, okay. Uh, the Fox and Dog also asked, has this hobby of wargaming taught you anything? Um, I've learned more about certain subjects, and, and what it has also helped me do is, like, if I'm playing a game about something, a lot of good games will include some really great historical notes as to, like, what the designer is trying to, to portray in the game and how they designed the game to match the history. Um, so you can get sort of like a, uh, like a, you know, public school rundown of a historical topic, even from a game, and then that will make me go, I would like to read more about this, and I'll go and I'll read more books. So, I, I mean, I could do a whole video, maybe I will at some point, about all the books that I have, which ones I've actually read, and which ones are on the backlog that I'm trying to work through. Um, and I have a lot of backlog, both for games and books, but that's the way it goes, right? Um... So, so I think, you know, for games on topics that I'm not super familiar with, it helps crack open the door and help me understand things a little bit better than I did. Um, even things like Arquebus, which I just played with a friend recently, you know, really understanding and appreciating how early firearms were used in conjunction with uh, formed formations of, of 
melee troops is kind of interesting. Like I knew that, but but understanding how that changed right at that moment in warfare against units that didn't have that formation, didn't have those added uh, ranged uh, men with the with the formation versus having them. I mean, just appreciating the nuance of that um, are some examples of stuff that I, I didn't appreciate before, but I gain a better appreciation of now. Um, we move on to the next question. Uh, T minus one asks, "What is your favorite board game to play solo?" That's really tough. Um, I mean, there's a lot of games that I really like that really can't be played solo, so I got to take them out of the running. Um, and I think a good solo game either has to have a solo bot, obviously, or plays in such a way that you can, you know, every time there's an action to take or a turn, um, you can just be picking the best actions to take on like your risk model of what is going to happen and what are the pros and cons of an action. If you can solidly make that decision regardless of whichever side you're playing or maybe you have a bias for a particular faction or something, that makes for a good um, good solo game. And I think, I think I really like Cataclysm, A Second World War for that. Uh, it is a game that is based heavily on chit pool. Um, and what you pull out of the chit cup and what actions you can take, just make it really solo friendly. And in fact, I have done a couple of really rough videos uh, via Vassal of me playing Cataclysm um, solo. And it, it's good because if you know the rules to Cataclysm very well um, and you're playing, in like, you, you know, you got Vassal up on a laptop or something, you can just ratchet your way through turns and it plays pretty quick. And, and you know, that quick gameplay is nice. Um, you know, you're just playing, playing the chit cup, right? You're just playing, you're, here's the chit, what can I do with it for this faction that will help them the most? I will do that, and now next chit, let's see what happens. Um, so, this is a pretty good game. It's not for everybody. It's got, you know, things that might rub people the wrong way. I like it for what it is. I think it's a neat game um, and fun to play solo. I've played, like, the Pacific War scenario within this, go this game solo a number of times, um, like half a dozen times. And it was pretty fun every time, so I, you know, I like it. So, worth checking out. I haven't done really much for it on the channel. Uh, maybe someday I'll, I'll do more on it. Um, okay, next question. Uh, oh boy, this is, it looks French. So, uh, and I am going to, I'm going to have a rough time with this one. I'm sorry. Uh, Giel, oh God, I'm sorry. I'm just good, dumb, dumb. American. Uh, Gila de Rey? Gia, Gia if, I, if it's a soft L, I don't know. G-I-L-L-E-S space D-E space R-A-I-S asks, why, there, why is there only one video on YouTube about Liebenstrom, a compass game? Is it that bad? So um, before this video, I tried to do a little research on Liebenstrom um, and uh, so it's it's interesting. So it's a war for Europe game. So European theater of operations. It is 1941 to 45. So it skips Poland. It skips France, and goes right to Barbarossa and everything after. Um, and it used to be a, a pair of magazine games. It used to be one magazine game called Liebenstrom and a magazine game called West Front, and they smooshed it together to make one cohesive game, but kept the name Liebenstrom. And based on what I've done, I've done what research I can do, the map isn't the prettiest map in the world. It's kind of bland, which for some people that's a big deal. You want a pretty map to look, uh, to look at while you play, that might be a big determining factor. It's kind of plain looking to, to me, aesthetically. Um, and the 41 to 45 is interesting because, you know, one of the problems of World War II European games is like, how do you make it so that the Axis can beat France, right? And there's a lot of thought around, should Germany always be able to defeat France very easily? But if they don't defeat France, or they don't defeat them easily, that kind of throws the whole rest of the war in the game. So how do you get around that? Well, you just say, you start the you start at 1941, after Poland and France are gone, and there you go. That solves the problem, right? Um, but for somebody who's looking for a true European theater of operations game, maybe you want Poland and France in there, and taking that away is a bummer. I don't know. I think the real answer to this is, you know, Compass Games has published a number of games that cover this era or this this specific conflict in the European theater of operations. So they have the war. Um, gosh, I can't remember some of the other ones off the top of my head. 
uh, I follow the Third Reich, but that's more like 43 to 45. I think the problem with Lebensraum is that it is a game amongst many others that do very similar things. And so GMT has games that sort of cover some of this stuff. Uh, Unconditional Surrender covers some of this stuff. Um, games like Whiff and A World at War cover this stuff. So I think for Lebensraum, it's like, it's obfuscation. It's, it's, it's got a lot of competition. For me, it's like, I don't think I would buy Lebensraum because I have other games that are kind of in that use case. So uh, is it is going to be that worthwhile to spend the money on another game that does something that a lot of the other games that I own already do? And I think that's probably the game's problem. You know, how much saturation of European theater, theaters of operation games can, can you have, right? There's Axis Empires, there's... Um, gosh, I mean, there's so many other ones, right? So it, it's really like, what is this game doing differently that makes it worthwhile? And just kind of looking into the game, I, I don't see anything that sticks out. I mean, it looks like it's fine. It's probably a fine game. I, you know, it's probably nothing truly bad about it. Um, but there's probably a lot of other games getting more visibility, and that's why there aren't as many reviews um, or input from the community on it. So, I don't know. Um, maybe you should get the game and check it out and make some videos. It'll be interesting to see. Um, and I could pronounce your name correctly next time. Uh, and then there was uh, a question around, um, I noticed an Empire of the Sun copy on the shelf. It has a different color than my second edition. Is it, is it a first edition or the latest? Well, um, I'm not sure if the color is just sort of because of the camera and the lighting in here, but I, I actually have two copies of Empire of the Sun on my shelf in that video um, that you might have seen. I'm not sure which one you're talking about, so I'll show what I have. Um, I have a second edition printing here uh, that I'm selling to... Um, camera screwed up there, so abrupt cut, sorry. Yes, I'm selling this copy to someone here in a few weeks. Um, we arranged the sale a while ago, but we're going to meet up finally and uh, sell it. I'm selling it because I have the third printing, um, which has a bigger box and just a couple of minor changes. It's sort of a weird upgrade, like I'm not getting a whole lot of better stuff in the latest printing. I just, I don't know. I wanted a, the new printing to get better play rate charts and things. I don't know. Um, so I'm selling that. I got this during the GMT sale, so I think it was like I'm netting having spent 15 bucks for this version of the game or something like that. Um, and it worked out. So I have two copies, second edition and a second edition second printing, which has the bigger box. Um, and at some point, I might do more on Empire of the Sun on the channel. Um, and I'm getting pressed for time, so I'm going to try to get through the rest of these questions very quickly. Um, SGJ uh, James asks, now that you have reached the big 500, maybe consider a space on BGG or Facebook? Besides your own channel, of course, what are some of your favorite gaming channels or podcasts? So, in terms of expanding out uh, the space here, um, it's something I've been thinking about. I realize I've made a fatal error in that I have my channel named after myself rather than some cool name that registers more easily with people. So, like, um, uh, Callendale is Callendale. Um, Players Aid is Players Aid. Counter Attack, Ardwolf Slayer. These are YouTube channels that I do like and I watch as I can. And Ardwolf, if you're out there, I, I try to watch what I can of your channel. Um, and, and I enjoy your videos. Really liked your When Eagles Fight video um, series. I watched every episode all the way through. Um, really enjoyed that. And at some point, I'd like to do something for that game myself on the channel. Um, but I'm just. I put my name, <laughs> and I probably should have come up with a better thing, like, it's the Zone of Control, that's one of the ones I was thinking, welcome to the Zone of Control, how does that, does that sound good? I don't know. Um, but then there's a bunch of issues with renaming a YouTube channel, and I'm, I'm not sure the best way to go about dealing with that. Um, so that's the question, right, like, do I go create a guild or blog on BGG, do I create a Facebook page that's specific to the Zone of Control, or whatever else we might call it? I'm not sure. I'd like to, because it, sometimes I want to leave a message for folks that, like, hey, I'm not going to get to a video this week, but here's something, blah, right? Um, 
to quickly send out a message, and YouTube doesn't do that very easily. And if you care, you could be like on the Facebook group, and you could see, or you could comment there, or I could share pictures of things that aren't necessarily video worthy, and that would be fun to do. Um, I just don't know the best way to proceed, and I kind of feel like I need a name to go with it. It can't just be me on Facebook. And I think maybe a couple of people have tried to look me up on Facebook. I will not accept friend requests of people I don't know in person. That's just how I operate with Facebook, because Facebook, you know, currently for me is like my family and, and close friends and that kind of thing, and I, I keep it to that for reasons. Um, and, you know, I would have a logically separate, like, here's a page, a, a group page or whatever that is specific to this YouTube channel, and then anybody could be involved in that. So, I don't know. It's something I've thought about. I just don't know where I'm coming down on it yet. Um, but yeah, gaming channels and podcasts, like I said, Callendale, Players Aid, Player Aid, Player, Players Aid guys do a fantastic job in, in, in what they put out. Um, they have a really good camera. I'm not sure what equipment they're using, but it looks like it's a really good camera. They have very high fidelity camera footage. Um, and they do a good job talking through stuff. Uh, like Counterattack is one I like to watch. Ardwell's Lair, um, again, I said those already. And, and there are others. Stuka Joe, um, gosh, I mean, it, I kind of feel like it's like if you can find somebody who uploads things routinely, I'm trying to subscribe to that person, probably like you maybe subscribe to me. Um, I have less time to just watch other people's videos, but I do like them. I think the Player's Aid is actually a nice compliment because what Player's Aid does tends to be really high-level stuff. So they're getting through a lot of games and they're doing it just that kind of like shallow, more shallow level of like, here's our thoughts, we played it, you know, here's what we're thinking. But they're not showing the game, they're, they're talking about the game with the box in front of them, where like you can get a feel and then if you want to dive deeper, that's where my channel can come in and zero in on something. But obviously my throughput is slower because it takes me a while uh, longer to get through a game like The Dark Valley, which we've been playing for many, many months now at this point. Um, okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, Ken asked, what is an era or conflict that you wish was better represented by designers or publishers? Uh, I think the medieval period, probably. Um, so I have Empires of the Middle Ages as sort of like this big strategic level game, um, and I like it. I think there are some issues with it that I would love to see that game reimagined in a modern way uh, to be more playable and, and to uh, be something I could get more people to try with me. Um, battles are a little bit better in the community uh, or in the industry because there are games that like cover the specific battle, uh, but not as many as maybe I would like. So I just think there should be more games that represent the medieval period, whether it's strategic level, which I would really like more strategic level games, or stuff like Nevsky, which just came out, which I think is hitting a nice spot that is worth expanding on. So, so I think medieval, the medieval period, Middle Ages, even the, what we would say the Dark Ages, like late antiquity, early, like Charlemagne time frame, uh, there needs to be more of, but it looks like maybe we're going to get some new games in that vein. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, yeah. Uh, Mike Stoddard asks, what war games did you get rid of in 2019? None. I got rid of none. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. I'm going to sell that one copy of Empire of the Sun, and then I might be trying to look to sell my older edition of Next War Korea, but that's in 2020. So, last year I got rid of nothing. Um, this year I might try to get rid of a couple things, but I don't really like to get rid of games. I'm like, I'm hoarding, I'm, I'm hoarding them a little bit, where it's like, I don't know if there are any games that I've just been totally dissatisfied with that I would get rid of. Um, other than A World at War, which I'm looking to still sell at this point. Um, I might change my mind on it, I don't know. But yeah, I haven't really gotten rid of a whole lot and I am unlikely to, um, except for games that I truly feel like I don't like or I will never ever ever play again. But I feel like any game I've played, it's like I would be happy, I would love to play that again. That's pretty cool, we'll, we'll do it again sometime at some point, that kind of thing. Um, and then there were a few people, uh, as a sort of closing question, there were a few people who had asked um, in other videos, uh, comments around, um, of the games that you have, how many have you played? Are you more of a player or a collector? Um, and I have, it's like both. I have to say both. So it's, I'm not a collector for collector's sake. I get games because I want to play them. I have copies of 
games that might be hard to find or are really old and have maybe a collector value, but I'm buying them to play them. So, um, like, I have a copy of Empires in Arms unpunched. I intend to punch it, right? It's not punched right now. I intend to punch it. I didn't buy it just to collect it. I mean, it's cool to have it, but it's not going to sit there unplayed, ideally. But the reality is, I do have a number of games that are unplayed. Now, I've tried to keep a ratio, and I think I'm somewhere around, like, 50%. And I don't know if that's bad or good. I suspect it's not too bad. Um, and there have been times where it was more like 60% or 70%, and then I got new games that I haven't really played. I have a number of games that, like, I don't know that I would count that I've played them. I've busted them out, and I've moved counters around. I've played a turn or two to get a feel for it. Um, but I don't know if I've really registered that in my own keeping system as having played it, because to me it's like I want to play a whole scenario or I want to play... The game and then say like okay here's my thoughts on it um, and I haven't done that for everything I mean I, there are a lot of games that I have not been played many have been punched most have been punched but um, some haven't been given the full gameplay experience and I'm gonna seek to change that over time obviously um, but new games come out I get new games I have stuff on p500 per from GMT and compass games so new things will be coming I'll be looking to play backlog stuff I think that's a problem that a lot of war gamers have, and I have it too. Same thing with books. So, um, I don't want to be a collector. I want to be a player. I just have created a big backlog for myself. Now, I, I think that was all the questions that I had as of today um, from that video. And if there are more questions in the future, I'll, I'll look to answer them as best I can in whichever way I, I can. Um, so, you know, guys, thanks for... Thanks for asking the questions. Thanks for your viewership. Thank you for the comments. Um, I really appreciate it. It makes my hobby a little more lively because I'm a busy guy um, and, and it's hard to get time to myself to play any games. But having the community here, being able to answer comments on YouTube uh, from my phone, I do a lot of that from my phone because I'm busy doing stuff, but I can say, hey, da 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 da. Um, that's really great. It keeps me engaged um, and I appreciate it. So keep that up, guys. And share your thoughts down in the comments about, you know, what, what do you think about expanding the space, right? Um, like I said, it, it, we could do it. I'm just not sure the best way to proceed. Um, and if a name changes in order, I don't want to confuse anybody. If all of a sudden the YouTube channel is, it has a different name and now you're not looking for Steve, you're looking for, like, Zone of Control. Does that make sense? I don't know. Um, but let me, let me know your thoughts and we'll proceed from there. So, hey, 500 subscribers and counting. Appreciate it, guys. Um, hope you enjoyed uh, the videos I've been doing and the more to come. Dark Valley will continue uh, until we finish the dang thing. And um, we'll see what else comes down the road in 2020. So uh, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. And we'll catch you next time. Okay, actually, one last thing. Um, also, my hair is drying, and so it's fluffing up. Um, figuring it out right now, next video for the Dark Valley will be turn 28, with uh, the final turn of the game being turn 44, so if you try to figure out some of the math there, we are still actually like two months away from being able to finish, or maybe a little bit longer, the Dark Valley, if I do two turns a week. But, knowing that, I have to start planning what I'm going to do next. Um, and I could do some things alongside the Dark Valley, but that will extend the length. So, um, if you guys have any suggestions of games maybe I already own is probably the easier thing that you really, really want to see. Uh, put that in the comments below also. I know there are a few folks that wanted to see Nevsky, um, also Arkabus, and those are pretty recent uh, games for me to, to be talking about. Um, but there's a lot of other stuff too, so let me know your thoughts. I've got a couple of ways that I might randomly determine what I'm going to cover next. Um, I also still would like to cover End of Empire, but there's a couple of things floating, so just let me know what you guys think might be fun to cover, and um, I'll take that into account with the decision-making. Um, yeah. Oh, and by the way, I think I'm supposed to say that my wife is awesome, and she is, so there you go. She buys me war games uh, for special occasions. She also uh, will play many games with me, mostly the, the card-driven games. She likes those. Um, I'm a very lucky man, that is for sure. Alright guys, this time for real, we'll, we'll catch you later.